When I was working in Oxford, which in terms of my career was really a pinnacle moment, my mother was very proud. And she was like, but you know, what do you think you can do in 10, 20 years? How is it going to help anybody to improve the lives of the people that live in our village? It's a wonderful time for me because I have seen the other side of what I studied and imagined in the laboratory. And what is even more exciting is that I'm seeing it applied and researched on in Africa. Just something I couldn't have imagined when I was 25. My name is Sheila Kaka Uchuboju. I was born in Nigeria. I studied medical biochemistry and then went on to do a PhD in plant biochemistry. Um, I did some postdoctoral work um, in Oxford at the Institute of Virology and Environmental Microbiology. So I specialized on a system called the Bacular Virus Expression System, which is a methodology that you use to genetically modify viruses. But by the time I went to university, I felt really prepared for the world. And then I realized, Perhaps not. <laughs> Perhaps I wasn't quite as prepared as I thought. Gender dynamics, I didn't understand it. And I'm 18 years old. I'm in a university. The idea that people had that women couldn't do things was a shock to me because I'd never actually been in an environment where people just thought, because you're a woman, you're less than. I mean, it just didn't make any sense to me. After I married and had children, um, I really wasn't interested in going back to science because it was just too difficult. I was fortunate that my ex-husband actually had studied uh, women in development. And he said, do you know the statistics, number one, of women who go to do PhD, like any women in the UK? It's like, First of all, at that time, it's like it's 6% that do PhD, male or female, of the population. And of that, how many of them are women? It's less than half. It's probably like 10%. Of that, how many of them are African? You'd actually have to go back. I realized that I wanted to do more in community work. So right now I'm working a lot um, with the UN environment and on environmental work with uh, different agencies. The big scientific uh, topic of our era, of our time, is climate change. Climate change and how it affects us in so many ways. In Africa, the discourse, the conversation is around adapting to climate change. African countries and developing countries basically are not the cause of climate change per se, but they're the ones suffering the most from the impact. So how the conversation in climate change is, is developed countries must mitigate, reduce their emissions, and African countries must adapt. So within climate change, there are a number of scientific lines of inquiry, but I would say in terms of what we are interested in, in some of the communities that we've worked with, it's to do with um, climate change and health. Climate change has caused uh, malaria epidemics to be more prevalent. Malaria, cholera, all of these things that have to do with the ecosystem changing. So now, you're looking at how climate change is affecting the disease, um, the disease outbreaks, and how now the system can adapt better. Kisumu is strategically important in the western region of Kenya because it borders Lake Victoria. 
And the lake is very important because it borders um, Uganda, Tanzania, and Kenya, and all of those communities living around there are living off the resources of the lake. And the lake is being rapidly degraded. So getting communities to understand how they're all impacting each other is an important part of the work we're doing in getting people to understand what ecosystems are and also what they can do to restore those. This is the smaller Nile perch. Uh, that the other one was bigger. And then people use it like they just fry. How much per kilo? We particularly decided to work with women because we understand how women very quickly see the big picture of their work and their position in communities. But in the bigger frame, how do we get women who are farming and different parts of the lake to understand um, how pesticides can run off into the lake and affect the livelihoods of women on the other side who are fishing? How do we connect these groups to begin to understand their impact? And how do we then connect the factories that are uh, uh, polluting the lake to understand what a devastating impact it is to the community that they are living in. So everybody that's working around there um, has an impact and has a responsibility. Kisumu is a county that adopted me when I came back to Kenya in 2014, 2015. So it's a county that I feel very close to. I'm very personally invested in the future of Kisumu. So one of the projects that we're involved in, working on and going to increasingly put our resources and energy in is the water hyacinth project in Kisumu. It's important that communities understand the science that affects them. And so when we look at communities like Kisumu, um, which is very much impacted by a pest on the lake. <laughs> when communities are not empowered to help to understand that system, they can't make decisions. I was born in a place like this in Nigeria. Um, I studied science because when I was growing up as a child, I was very interested in insects. I, I would play by the river. So I was curious about the natural world. So I ended up studying science and I became a scientist. Then one day I, I came back to my mother and I said to her, oh, look, I'm in a magazine, see me. Ah, this is my work. They're talking about the work that I'm doing. And she said, it is good, my daughter, it is good. But how is this work that you are doing here going to uh, relate to the people back home? So when she asked me that question, I didn't have an answer. What is it that we can do to transform the lives of women? And we were looking at everything, the city, health, agriculture, all the different sectors. What kind of science can we bring to make a difference to the lives of everyone in Kisumu? We have to bring anything we have learned from anywhere and plant it where we can have effect and with people that we love. So as we move, we must all move to get to a better future because that is what we want for ourselves and our children. And by God's grace, by the time we reach 2030, they will see a different Kisumu in this Kenya. That is our prayer.
This really touches my heart. Working with women across the lake who harvest the water hyacinth. Because the work that I was doing from PhD on was looking at pests. We are looking at how to help people manage pests better so that they can enhance their livelihoods. There was a lot of water hyacinth here, mm -hmm. but um, because it has a, a circle, the moment you start seeing long grass yeah. um, um, coming out of it, mm. then you know it's the life cycle is coming to yes. an end. So that is the time it disappears. It sinks to the bottom of the, mm. of the water, and within no time again, it's, it has covered the water body. What the women were able to do is to understand that although it's a pest, they can harvest it in the same way as they harvest some of the papyrus and all the other resources there, and that they can use it to make products. And over time, they've begun to make more and more sophisticated products, and they've begun to open up markets for high-end goods. I can see this growing as the machinery to mould bigger products comes. But it starts with the women going out onto the lake, getting the water hyacinth, weaving it into threads, and very manually developing the rope that then gets made into the product. Wow. Show me. <laughs> so when I got involved with the water hyacinth project and began to see what they were doing, the, you know, the, the word that came to me was like, wow, you're just moving from pest to profit. Really, it's, it's just a very simple trajectory. When we went into the community to talk to the women, they had formed into a collective which had a name in Luo, which was, we're fighting away poverty. That was the name of the group. But now, this time when we went in, we asked them the name of the group. They said, no, we're now the women who live under the shade. And honestly, I nearly cried because that really shows the transformation in that community. They renamed themselves. They were like, you're no longer chasing poverty. We have a livelihood. We're living under the shade. We're no longer suffering from the harshness of our environment. We've figured out how to make this, and this is who we now are. And that was the most emotional moment for me. So on the 8th of March, International Women's Day, we formally launched NAWE, the Network of African Women Environmentalists, to showcase African women environmentalists at all different levels and how they can be brought to help the ecosystem's restoration agenda. Thunda? Hi! <laughs> Welcome! Thank you! Good to see you! Yep, thank you. Good yeah, to see you! Yeah. Welcome! Thank you. Yeah, in fact, the other ladies are waiting All right. over there. Shall okay. we go and meet them? Yes, let me I'll just, just put this here and then we'll get... Brilliant! Cool. Brilliant! Let's, okay. let's yeah. just grab that. All right. And then let's go! Okay. Yeah. All the big madams. Of course, <laughs> all the big madams. <laughs> yeah. We thank God. Uh -huh. Sheila, welcome. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, this is exciting. Yeah. I need to introduce you. So this is uh, Juliette, who is the head of our Africa office here at UN Environment. And um, this is uh, Mesrach, who's leading our energy work on the African continent, and Janet, who's the head of our gender yeah. program here at and UN I, Environment. I met her at the launch, yes. Yes, yes, yeah. she was at the launch of NAWE, indeed. It just happened that on the 1st of March, the United Nations, um, through the government of El Salvador, put together a, a resolution which was passed on the 1st of March for the UN Decade on Ecosystem Restoration. Yeah. And we know how much land on this continent yeah. is degraded, you know, how many women are suffering. So this decade is now 2021 through to 2030, the last 10 years of the Sustainable Development Goals. One of the things we found in um, environmental governance is that women are not at the decision-making table. Said, yeah. We might say that women are the ones who are in touch with the environment because of the work they do on a yeah. daily basis, but in terms of decision-making, they are not there. Yeah. And it's important because they feel the brunt of the decisions, yes. and then by then it's too yes. late yes. if it's gone down a path that's yeah. disadvantaged. Um, one of the areas of focusing on was on energy, 
waste and climate change. I mean, yeah. the same story everywhere. I think mm -hmm. interface between policy and science is fundamental yeah, for yeah, us to succeed. Yeah. And this is precisely what the Nawe is yeah, about. exactly. And, and I think for, for, for us, part of our thinking around the network on African women environmentalists was what we've just discussed, yeah. looking at the political element, yeah, yeah. which I think was so important, mm -hmm. and also looking at the realities. What is the reality in, in women's lives? Mm -hmm. It's going to take us doing more. And it has to reach, the connection has to go all the way to the ground. We have to see the impact. Mm -hmm. And so, but... She has been able to mediate the steps of bringing you wonderful ladies on board because she's been a champion for it and to get women that are truly committed to it because it's different from having women that just have positions but women that have heart in it. And I have good news for now, yeah? mm -hmm. UNESCO uh, told me that they have money for women, uh, to promote women scientists. So I, I think this will not our last meeting. Okay. This is just a start. <laughs> yes. Thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Thank you for making it. Society comes together in a governance system, and then the science is one aspect of it. You see it beautifully in climate change because you look at the climate change agreements or not and how countries agree to reduce emissions. Hopefully the science tells you that this is impacting our environment in negative ways and is causing a exacerbating climate change. Hopefully that makes the political uh, decision makers say, therefore, we will close these factories. Therefore, we will do this differently. But the trigger, the initiator, the propeller is the political will at the top. So the best science in the world, most of it, a lot of it, is left on the shelf because there's not the political will. And even in something like climate change, as we have seen, the loss of political will could mean we lose this battle. I want to become a transformative scientist so that everything that I apply myself to brings about a transformation and an impact that is visible and in my lifetime. By bringing women around particular landscapes and ecosystems together, how do we then improve that landscape and restore it? A lot of... Um, farms and lands in rural Africa are left because young people, they want a better life. They don't want to farm. They, it's no longer cool. The profits are low. They want to go to the city and live better lives. So you're finding a lot of um, degraded land because nobody's tending to it. We are looking at what kinds of farming opportunities are there for young people that are attractive, that are the profit margins are high, that um, can be done somewhat remotely in that, you know, it's not high intensive farming, doesn't need machinery and is organic. So one of the crops that is doing very well is chia. Wow, this is incredible. Yeah, this is, this is where it happens. This is where <laughs> the magic happens. <laughs> but you know, what I think yeah. is First of all, what I'm really excited about uh -huh. is that you have restored this landscape that yeah. it was just going to seed and that yeah. this, not only have you restored the landscape so that it's productive, it's productive. you're nourishing the soil and starting a whole new incredible, I like know. 21st century business. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. So you okay. just pull the whole thing okay. and then and you... Then you... Uh, I don't know, what is this? Rapid so young people who left went to the city and are struggling because there are not as many opportunities as they imagine, are now remembering that their fathers and their mothers have lands that are not far away in the rural areas. So a number of them, increasingly women, are beginning to hire local farmers to plant chia seeds. Chia is booming all over the world, and interestingly enough in Kenya. The profit margins are really high. Okay, so just cut it. Okay. And yep, that's it, we have it. Wow. Having fun? 
Yeah, actually. <laughs> I'm actually having fun. It's actually yeah. a really good day. You should come every time we have it. I, so I, that no, you... I think we need to bring a group of women to harvest and make something of it. Yeah. So perhaps like a demonstration farm. Yeah. Bring them, they harvest, we sit, we talk about what we can do restoring landscapes and this is yeah. how now we can begin to grow with yeah, young and women. And then now we start talking about the health yeah. benefits of it. Yeah. We are in the first generation that our children have worse opportunities than us. Be careful. <laughs> and now, even with climate change, they're saying you came here, you enjoyed yourselves, you ruined the planet, you left us nothing. Each generation is brought with its own gift. And we have this generation, um, they are passionate about the environment. Right? So that's why I'm saying we are going to have like a food forest around where you had the pit, okay? So you'll follow me and then you place the trees, uh, seedlings in the holes are waiting for planting after. So all the, all the ones in the pit... What does it take to make a transformation? We can now measure it. If we could work hard to make sure many of those goals that empower women, empower children, come to being. The picture that people have in their heads of Africa will transform. It can, it's, it's an easy thing, it can. Other countries have done it. Okay, I'm going to follow up. <laughs> Within a generation, you can transform outcomes. It takes certain things. And I pray that I will be part of that and that my children who were born in the UK and come back will be able to say, wow, you know, I might just move to Africa because it's really great. You know, it has many opportunities and it's got great weather, great people, great opportunities. I can build a life here. Okay, when I was nine years old and I went to London and I went to primary school, I remember I was playing in the playground, I was being bullied because I looked so different. And they would laugh at me and they'll be like, ah, you came from Africa, you live on trees. And, and I remember how shocked I was that they would, they would speak about the place that I loved and that I missed so much, that gave me all of my identity in such derogatory terms that they could not understand the beauty, the power, the opportunities that I got from those nine years. And that moment, I said to myself in my head, when will be the day that I won't have to make so many explanations because it will be obvious how rich, how beautiful, how glorious we are, all of us on this planet, not just Africa. We are just one species on this planet, just one. We happen to be the most destructive of all the species. Let's be clear, this planet will survive with or without us. We can destroy ourselves and have an empty shell. There are many planets out there that are uninhabited. They're still there. So let's have a little humility as to our significance. We have become extraordinarily arrogant in thinking that we matter. We're just one species. In fact, the insects will still be here when it's all gone. Let's be humble and let's begin to be better stewards of the gifts that we've been given.